hosted by SUNY and the New York Department of Financial Services. I'm Maria Filipakis, and I will be your moderator today. In today's session, we're going to focus on entrepreneurship in crypto and decentralized finance. Now, what does that mean? Well, there's an argument that decentralized finance or DeFi for short is the one area of crypto development with the greatest potential for disruption by innovation in entrepreneurs. We're gonna cover what that means exactly today. In addition to defining some terms, um, highlighting some significant issues and resources that entrepreneurs and investors uh, who are thinking about entering the space should be aware of, uh, as well as some of the uh, uh, risks and opportunities uh, that are out there in the space. Uh, what we do know is that there is a lot of attention, great deal of investment and technical development in the space. And DeFi is really poised to be a major factor in global banking going forward. There's high interest, and that means plenty of room for innovation. So I am very happy to start off with uh, some uh, intros of our incredible expert panel that we have here today for you. And we're going to start off with uh, Danling Jiang. Danling, please introduce yourself. Thank you, Maria. Uh, hello, everyone, the audience and the panelists. Uh, my name is Danny Zhang. I'm a professor of finance and associate dean of research and faculty development in the College of Business of Stony Brook University. So here in the college, I also co-direct the blockchain business lab, which serves as the platform to engage students and faculty to work on projects related to blockchain business and finance applications. Thank you for having me. Great, thank you, Dan Ling. We're so happy that you could participate. Stani, you're next. <laughs> hey everyone, I'm, I'm Stani Blechov. I'm the uh, CEO and, and founder of Aave. And Aave is a uh, decentralized uh, liquidity protocol running on Ethereum where uh, you can deposit cryptographic assets and, and, and see them grow in, in interest. Uh, started uh, building smart contracts uh, and, and decentralized finance uh, four years ago. And, and before that, uh, my academic background is in, in uh, law. And, and that is how I, I practically found myself into, into the uh, smart contracts and, and uh, decentralized uh, finance. Great, Aaron. Yeah, thanks so much, uh, Maria. Thanks so much to SUNY and the Department of Financial Services for putting this together. Um, and it's great to be on this panel with, with Stani and everyone else. Uh, my name is Aaron Wright. I'm a clinical professor at Cardozo Law School, um, which is part of Yeshiva University. My research has focused exclusively on blockchain technology uh, since I've been at Cardozo. Uh, I've had the pleasure of working with a number of great projects in this space uh, through several programs I run at Cardozo uh, and also uh, co-authored a book that Harvard uh, University Press published on blockchain law and policy. It's really great to be here. Great, and, and lastly, I'll introduce myself. I'm Maria Filipakis. I will be your moderator today, and I'm the co-founder and managing partner of the Topside Group. I was the first executive deputy superintendent of the Capital Markets Division at the New York State Department of Financial Services and oversaw the development of New York's virtual currency regulatory framework. Um, now, just a couple of logistics before we really get into the substance today. Um, today's session is going to run for, uh, for uh, about an hour. Um, as you've seen, we've got an incredible panel. Uh, and what we're really going to do and what we're really hoping for is to have a semi-structured discussion, but really conversational with these expert panelists interspersed with or followed by questions from the audience. So just a couple of more logistics hashtag. We want to invite webinar attendees to, to tweet using the hashtag fintech innovation series. And if you wish tag anyone, please use at RF SUNY, um, at SUNY and or at New York DFS. And remember, use the chat function for comments if you'd like to address us here today. And with that, let's get going. 
Great. So I'm going to sort of start off with you, Erin. Um, there are many that are familiar with terms like Bitcoin or cryptocurrency. They may not be as familiar with decentralized finance or DeFi. So could you just explain the term for those who are sort of new to this and what's the core technology that's enabling this finance? Sure. So if you've heard of Bitcoin uh, and or uh, Ether or a number of other emerging digital assets, including most recently assets like Dogecoin, they all rely on an underlying data structure referred to as a blockchain. Uh, and what decentralized finance uh, does is that it uses blockchain technology and a related uh, technology called smart contracts, which I'm sure we'll get into, uh, mm -hmm. to begin to create financial services and other products that are ideally non-custodial in nature. Uh, so the goal is to create uh, automated systems or nearly completely automated systems uh, that rely on a blockchain as kind of their backbone or spine uh, and don't uh, necessarily rely on a central party in order to administer um, these services. And the landscape for DeFi is growing really fast. Uh, and I'm sure we'll kind of provide some more context of what that uh, looks like, uh, but it's grown nearly exponentially over the past year, year and a half. Uh, which is not surprising because many folks that have been trying to uh, develop on, on blockchains and in particular in the Ethereum ecosystem have thought about uh, many of these uh, products and services over the past five to six years. Uh, one way I like to think about it is that um, we're basically building an entirely digital Wall Street. Uh, so a Wall Street from the ground up, uh, which is going to have lots of different pieces and moving parts. This is going to include things like decentralized exchanges, borrowing and lending protocols, derivative and synthetic asset protocols, insurance protocols, and then a whole host of other tools that are built on top of this, things like aggregation tools, like DEX aggregators, yield and asset management protocols. Uh, so it's a really broad mantle. It's growing really fast. Uh, probably and arguably the only sector that's growing faster in the blockchain ecosystem is NFTs, but maybe that's for a separate panel. So hopefully that <laughs> provided a bit, bit of an overview. I guess one last thing to note, which is uh, particularly interesting, is that many of these protocols generate a rate of return or a yield. Um, and that is creating a bit of a flywheel, a flywheel between Bitcoin and other digital assets. Uh, and it's also creating opportunities you know, to, uh, for folks to profit or uh, for more capital to kind of flow into the system. Well, thank, thanks, Aaron. I, you know, I, I, I kind of like the term digital Wall Street and I think we'll sort of uh, cover that uh, in, in a couple of other questions uh, as we sort of move through the session. Um, but I'm sort of thinking of ways we can kind of talk about all the benefits and advantages and of opportunities of a digital Wall Street without necessarily some of the, the risks. <laughs> um, Stani, let me, let me turn it over to you. You know, Aaron sort of mentioned protocols and apps, and he started to kind of get into the relationship between that, but also listed things like, right, nifties, um, which we're hearing a lot about, and uh, stable coins, and, you know, sort of like flash lending. Could, could you sort of talk to us a little bit about that relationship? relationship and how it's different in a, in a DeFi finance world, and also maybe sort of walk us through a real world example, a little bit of what you guys are doing um, at uh, Aave. Definitely, Maria. It's, uh, yeah, as uh, Ara mentioned, uh, what mm -hmm. decentralized finance actually uh, allows us all to do is it creates this kind of like an uh, ecosystem or network where applications talk to each other. So let's say uh, we have different kinds of, let's say, protocols, uh, might be uh, lending protocols, uh, just uh, asset swapping protocols where you can just have one particular uh, cryptographic asset that you can swap into a, a, another one. Uh, and then lending protocols where you can deposit those assets and earn uh, uh, interest rates, which, which Aave, for example, is. And what makes DeFi very, very uh, unique today uh, compared to the traditional finance is that all of these uh, services and, and the you know, kind of like a functioning and the logic which is built into the smart contracts are in the same network. And, and in, in most cases, for example, it's Ethereum, it means that uh, anyone can access those, uh, those services and, and, and not just access those services, but they're available for them 24 um, seven, meaning that uh, the network is upheld all the time and, and there isn't kind of like a denial of service uh, modes, but also it brings sort of transparency in the sense that um, the public public blockchains, where usually these decentralized financial protocols and applications are, are built, are actually uh, transparent to the extent that you can actually see all of the transactions that are going uh, in and out. Uh, you can see the 
various exposures that are in the protocol. For example, if you look at our protocol, you can see what's the current amount of collaterals used, uh, what kind of different collateral compositions there are, and how much there is actually depth uh, in the system. And since the whole DeFi is, is similar in open nature and transparent, it also means that uh, we can actually uh, see uh, on every second what's the whole exposure of the ecosystem. For example, whether there is some sort of a cryptographic stablecoin, which is uh, pegged to the US dollar value, how much do we have the stablecoin, where that exposure is. And, and this brings a uh, very new kind of, um, I would say, auditability Mm -hmm. uh, into finance because you actually can see um, the, not just the exposure but also kind of like how people are using these financial services and and kind of like try to improve them and part of the 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 accessibility uh, is also the accessibility to build services before uh, decentralized finance I was building more financial applications uh, so-called fintech as we know uh, here and the thing with fintech we usually build user experiences so we try to make new applications and use cases uh, but what we're doing in decentralized finance we kind of are reshaping the back end of the financial system like the back end of the banking and making it more efficient and since uh, decentralized finance essentially is a pool of liquidity where funds flow anyone can build new algorithms new products and services and receive that liquidity so it's kind of like a matching market between uh end users and the protocol builders. That is what makes uh, DeFi unique. Yeah. So, uh, so uh, you know, Danling, I think this kind of perfectly sets it up to getting into the next area, uh, which talks about um, um, really DeFi as a, as a disruptor. You know, what uh, essentially uh, we heard from Stani is uh, that, you know, uh, that this is an area where there is a lot of new accessibility, there's kind of a back end that's being built, right? There is a fair amount of transparency and kind of liquidity in the market, right? Um, and I, I think in many ways, he's kind of highlighted the areas that someone can point to and say, well, these are areas that could potentially disrupt, right, the traditional financial services sector. What I'd like for you um, to maybe kind of talk about, Danling, is, um, is this really a threat? And, and, and why is it? It's posed as a threat, as a disruptor to the system. Um, we'd love to hear you talk about that a little bit. Okay, so I want to talk about the customer like um, uh, benefits by using DeFi and contrast that with our existing financial system. So from a customer perspective and the DeFi uh, protocol, protocols are permissionless. So anybody can join, can use the service without providing sometimes your name. So I would tell my student DeFi is more like um, a virtual vending machine well, for financial services. Anyone with a cell phone, with internet uh, access, or with a browser of your uh, computer can use those services. In contrast to our existing financial system because of technology and because of regulation, not everybody can have even a bank account. So it's estimated we have 7 million households in the US who don't have a bank account. Many more are unserviced or underserviced by the financial system. So they cannot partake this um, system and use the services. And also the DeFi offers a very speedy transaction and instant settlement or a settlement by a few minutes or uh, a, a few seconds. So this makes financial services achievable by it, any protocol you employ on the internet is achievable and useful by uh, everyone on the planet. It's global. So in contrast, our financial system has this delayed settlement, right? If we trace back, it takes a day or two to settle. And those are the features that really makes a DeFi appealing. In addition, uh, Stanley and um, uh, Aaron talk about the cost, right? So right. for customers, it's relatively cheap to use DeFi. And for the team, project teams, it's relatively cheap to uh, uh, de deploy a protocol on the, on the internet, DeFi protocol. In contrast, our existing financial system, uh, it's estimated it costs over half a million dollars to maintain a bank branch in the US, right? Mm -hmm. so, so that's another potential uh, a, a threat or disruptive feature. Lastly, Stanley mentioned that by using DeFi, we actually can get single digit, sometimes double digit yield. 
And this is again conscious with our existing financial system that which provides nearly zero yield if you have a money in the bank. So this disintimidation feature of DeFi is considered to be threat to the financial system. And people feel like, oh my God, DeFi is gonna replacing us because they're gonna replace the bank tellers and other um, uh, existing uh, fun foundation or, or infrastructure of the, of the uh, system, right? Um, but I, I, I think we don't have to perceive every threat as you know, danger. Instead, we can perceive them as competition, and competition leads to innovation and leads to opportunities, right? So some of the um, um, some of them, Aaron and Stanley talk about, you know, yeah. having this new technology, we can rebuild and upgrade our existing infrastructure financial, for financial services. We can become more efficient and safer, and we can achieve better financial inclusions. I also perceive that I feel like digital wallets might be a growth area opportunity for a lot of financial institutions. As a user of DeFi myself, and I use more traditional financial services, I wish there is something that we can get access to both centralized and decentralized finance through one single digital wallet. Right. Lastly, I can, I can see that the growth of the blockchain and digital asset markets it's going to be a trillion dollar business right down the road. And that generates tremendous opportunities for market making, uh, trading, investing, and a lot of other services. This is like exciting area, right? For uh, financial institutions to innovate and to embrace. So yeah. it's not just threat. I think it's more about opportunity. So I, I think that's really interesting, right? Because you, you've highlighted where the two can coexist and potentially having a wallet where, where that's, uh, you know, uh, available as an option. I think you've talked about it as, you know, yes, if you want to characterize it as a threat, you know, there, there's obviously a sort of negative connotation to that. But what you're talking about is good, healthy market competition. And, um, you know, I know you talked about it as a kind of virtual vending machine in in the ability to reach more people and have it be uh, more friendly and accessible to consumers, right, and more efficient. Um, Aaron, um, that's all great, but if someone's out there and they're thinking, well, you know, lovely virtual vending machine, right, but what does that mean in terms of some of the risks? Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and just on the opportunities, one analogy I tend to like to think about is just electric cars versus gasoline powered cars. Uh, you know, well, both are, <laughs> yeah, well, and I think it's similar, right? I think, um, right. you know, in many ways, uh, DeFi is like the electric car for Wall Street. It was reimagined from the ground up. If you wanted to append in a battery onto a gas guzzling car, didn't work as well, right? It required companies like Tesla to reimagine it from the beginning, the entire, right. the entire process from soup to nuts in order to, to kind of push things forward. I think DeFi does that, right? And Stani mentioned this before. The interoperability, the the lack of jurisdictional boundaries, uh, the open and permission uh, permissionless aspects of many parts of, of DeFi, uh, I think give it just the scale and reach of the internet itself. Something that our current financial system doesn't have, um, and that's tremendous. And the benefits are profound, right? Like lower cost, greater accessibility, uh, opportunities for financial inclusion, and something that we didn't touch on, which I also think is really important. And I think Ave is a great example of this. Uh, the ability to have community-run financial infrastructure. Uh, so the way a lot of these uh, protocols and services operate, there's not a company that's in charge of it. It's an entire ecosystem and community. It's much more like Wikipedia, uh, which has a whole bunch of folks tending to it as opposed to a corporate enter en uh, enterprise. And it, it uh, arguably has a higher degree of security as well. You know, that being said, it's early days for DeFi, it's early days for blockchain uh, in my mind. And since I'm bald and saw the first wave of the, the internet, um, it feels a lot like web one. It feels like the early days of the internet where things look a little bit funny, they don't work all the time, there's weird errors, there's new tools that you have to use. And that's mm -hmm. exciting, but also you know, terrifying for everyday consumers. Uh, so right now there's still high barriers to entry. If you wanna play around with DeFi, you need to be pretty technically sophisticated. Uh, it's not yet ready for kind of uh, mass uh, consumer adoption, although you know, as the months go, go by, it's getting easier and uh, uh, easier and easier to use. 
Um, you know, many of these services, especially more advanced DeFi projects are using leverage. And whenever you add a leverage into a system that obviously increases risk, and that's something that folks are very worried about. And I imagine regulators are as well. We're seeing a lot of uh, interest and, and value flowing into DeFi. Uh, we haven't yet gone through the cycle where a whole bunch of value flows out of DeFi. And so I think that there are questions about runs on liquidity, what that means, how resilient the system is. Uh, and obviously there's benefits to composability, the ability for all these different services to talk to one another. That's something we don't uh, fully have in today's uh, financial system, but in DeFi it comes out of the box. But that mm -hmm. also raises kind of questions about entropy and any complexity that's created by the composability. So we may see, we've already seen this in so, some sophisticated hacks or attacks on DeFi protocols, uh, but uh, fully fleshed out and, and built DeFi uh, may have entrop entropy or complexity that we're not familiar with. And then last, and this is what regulators across the country and across the globe are grappling with, are all these regulatory questions. Uh, some of the assets that these uh, DeFi protocols rely on, things like governance tokens, it's not clear what they should be characterized as. Uh, it's not clear where liability should attach uh, if something goes wrong. Uh, it's not clear uh, for DEXs and other market participants, whether folks there will be responsible. There's lots of open questions that need to be sorted through and hopefully will be sorted through uh, expeditiously uh, so we can build kind of this modern electric car version of Wall Street instead of this hulking gas guzzling uh, version of Wall Street that we have today. Stani, I want to turn to you now. Um, and, you know, Aaron used this electric car version of, of Wall Street um, analogy. Um, I want to kind of get your thoughts on that. And then I and then followed up with, I know we have a, a question from um, the attendees uh, as to whether or not you would explain how yield is generated on Aave and how it's sort of different from, from other protocols like BNP. So I'm going to turn it to you now, Stani. Yeah, thanks. Uh, it's it's actually fairly interesting how it how it works. So so in practice, the whole protocol is relying on on smart contracts on Ethereum, and and that smart contract logic has uh, in itself uh, practically interest rate formula uh, based on on the utilization of of uh, of the assets that are are deposited into the protocol. So let's say uh, if a user comes and deposits uh, stable coins such as USDC into the protocol, uh, then someone else is actually borrowing that uh, USDC out of the system against a, a deposit collateral asset. So um, in, in general, this kind of like a demand will, will create uh, yield uh, there. And these yield curves are pretty much set by the, the governance. So uh, decentralized finance, one of the important functionalities is that these protocols are owned by the communities. And by, what I mean by communities is that any kind of change into the protocol can't be made by the team who actually created the protocol. For example, uh, I suddenly cannot go and change the protocol uh, interest rate curves, uh, the risk parameters, no one from the actual uh, Genesis team could do that. And, and to make actually changes into the protocol, you have to actually go through governance, meaning all the other token holders that are uh, stakeholders have to come together and vote on these changes. And that's, that was actually what is decentralization. And practically, the governance sets those interest rates and, and, and the curves. And based on actually then, uh, the curves are pretty much starting and ending points where the interest rates start to increase based on the utilization. So I would say that if you compare to traditional finance uh, first, firstly, in traditional finance, you, you put funds into a savings account and, and let's say a bank takes those funds and, and then distributes them elsewhere, uh, depending on their risks, rewards, and, and tries to generate yield. So uh, in, in Aave's case, uh, how it works is that actually uh, you can always borrow, but you need to have collateralization. So the system is, is less riskier in, in, in that sense, but there's other kind of risks, like technical risk, for example, what Ara mentioned uh, previously in, in, in the panel. And when we compare it to something like uh, BNB, like Binance, or other kind of centralized providers who provide also uh, deposit accounts where you can actually yield on, on your cryptographic assets and you can borrow against them, uh, the main big difference is that uh, those service providers are practically taking custody of your funds. So with decentralized finance and decentralized protocols, you're actually, as an end user, you're interacting directly with the protocol. So you keep your custody the same way as you create your uh, 
uh, cryptocurrency uh, wallet. You, you generate the, the public key, you generate the private key, and, and then you are in the possession of the private key and, and you manage your and control your own funds. And the same way with how these decentralized protocols work is that you can interact with them directly with your keys and, and, and pretty much you can withdraw from the protocol depending on the logic of, 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 of these decentralized protocols. And, and that is a significant difference. So let's say in, in Aave's case, uh, we have particular risk parameters or particular limitations, like how much risk the protocol can take, how much you can borrow from the uh, protocol against the collateral compositions. But in centralized finance, you basically are more flexible to actually uh, go beyond those limits and actually take more exposure, which on, on the other hand is very tricky, especially because uh, centralized providers do not have the same transparency as decentralized finance has. So in decentralized finance, you practically see the whole exposure uh, throughout not just all the protocol, but but actually the other protocols, uh, Maker and Uniswap, and see how how much actually assets there are, how much liquidity there are, and and those kind of like a um, that transparency is important in the sense when you're using cryptographic assets as a collateral to to borrow against. Uh, you need to have sufficient liquidity as well. And that is why like this overall transparency is, is very uh, important. So, so Stani, look, you, you've talked about uh, the transparency uh, uh, that's kind of built in the system and you've talked about collateralization. And I think essentially a kind of uh, back and forth, which would I be able to say it's kind of a flash loan essentially in how you kind of- flash. Yeah, flat, so, so the basic borrowing is collateralized. And then what, why other protocol is very unique is because we have this flash borrowing functionality. Okay. And, and that means that you can actually borrow funds from the protocol without having any collateral. And this is significant because of the pseudonymous nature of decentralized finance and the accounts usually yeah. have to have some sort of a collateral. So flash loan works, works in a way that you can borrow from the protocol, no collateral, and you can use those funds uh, uh, in decentralized finance on, or, or the whole Ethereum network and do different kinds of strategies. Uh, it might be arbitrage or you might refinance loans. So it's kind of like a background working capital that you're taking for uh, one Ethereum block. And that's the kind of like a current limitation. For example, if you take a flash loan, you need to return the funds with the same Ethereum block. Now, how this makes sense is that the uh, blockchain Ethereum settles every block, meaning that each block has a certain amount of transactions and each right. transaction can have sub-transactions. So one transaction could be a way where you are taking flash loan from Aave and, and you might buy an asset from, from uh, Uniswap and sell it on a higher price uh, in Balancer, which is another DeFi uh, swap protocol, and then return the, the, the flash loan and, and keep the proceeds. And this all can be done uh, in one um, Ethereum kind of like a block. So flash loan is kind of like a way to borrow for a few seconds and do uh, like uh, pretty much like take uh, take advantage of the arbitrage opportunities in, in DeFi. And I think we have now uh, until this point over 2 billion worth of flash loans since the beginning of the year, which means that they're very popular, but end users like normal DeFi users, such as for example me and Aaron, we don't basically use that much of flash loans, but it's something that if you use a service where we swap, uh, let's say, uh, loan position from Aave to another protocol or from, let's say, Maker to Aave, um, there might be a flash loan in the background doing all the refinancing work. So it's something that's invisible for the end user, but very highly used in, in the DeFi space. Hey, Don Lane, now, now hearing um, uh, uh, how, how Stani sort of walked us through um, flash loans and, and, and some of what Aave does, um, do you see any sort of, of, of risks or how does that work? Uh, in this world where uh, uh, sort of traditional and, and DeFi finance systems can coexist? Um, so I, I, I feel like um, DeFi, I still feel like their technology can be integrated with existing financial system because what they have is a technology that solves a lot of problems we have existing system. But what they don't have is what the traditional finance have is 95% of the customers, right? So right now, 5% of people um, in the US own Bitcoin, less than 8% of them uh, own cryptocurrency. But the traditional financial service is serving 95% of the population. And they have much, in my opinion, more like accessible interface for ordinary Americans, right? So as Aaron mentioned that if you want to use DeFi, 
of course, you don't need to trust institution. You don't need to trust um, a person. You need to trust the code. But not everybody can read the code and can use, yeah, can understand the, the, the risk behind the code. So I feel like by integrating what we have with the traditional system and what we have with the DeFi uh, protocols and the blockchain technology, maybe we can make this technology or DeFi services more accessible by ordinary people. Well, you know, uh, Dunlin, I want to follow on that, and then I want to turn this to all the panelists. Um, so, so one, you know, one one question you get is you hear all of this, and it sounds, you know, listening to all of you um, speak on the topic, that this sounds, uh, you know, super technical and complicated, and the question becomes, well, this is all really sort of wonderful and innovative, and we hear you all kind of laying out all the opportunities out there, but how do you explain this to someone's parents um, or sort of elderly who may want to be involved in this, but are a little too nervous or scared or so used to the kind of more normal, I'll put that in quotes, or traditional banking system, um, that this just seems too risky or quite frankly, just kind of difficult to understand. Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. I think it's a lot like the internet. So, it, you know, many <laughs> folks that are elderly, um, you know, or not technically sophisticated can't take advantage of lots of the, the great innovations that we've seen since the, you know, early to mid 1990s on the consumer web. Um, and, you know, if you go back in time to web one, it was brutal, right? It took forever to load up an image. It had lots of weird beeping noises. Uh, it didn't have uniform um, pricing, it just in terms of, you know, accessing the internet um, and things broke all the time. Uh, but, at, at, you know, 20 plus years later, I think that there's been more density uh, of the internet into people's lives and more use, use of it. Uh, I do think what we're talking about now are these core protocols that will sit kind of under the hood. And what I imagine we'll begin to see more and more of are services that kind of aggregate uh, and push up and build better user experiences for folks to participate um, in these types of platforms. Uh, if you do want to uh, learn more, the nice thing about blockchain technology, DeFi, uh, and other open source technology is the information is available online. Uh, you can begin to read a lot about it, understand more and more about it, and, and begin to um, and begin to participate it if you think that it makes sense and if it fits your risk profile. Uh, you know, because this is very risky technology and it's also uh, risky when it comes to um, an investment as well. Well, I would take things a little bit out of order here. We've, we've seen, um, uh, you know, quite a number of the traditional financial institutions, right? If you just kind of take a look at what's out there in the, in the news of late, um, uh, you know, entities like Morgan Stanley and, and Bank of New York Mellon, Fidelity and others, have entered the digital currency space as sort of investors, as participants, and in lots of different ways, they've become sort of stakeholders. And kind of following up on this question of, um, you know, are you comfortable being in the space? Who should be in the space? How do you explain this to, to those that are maybe fairly new to this or can't understand it? What do you think, Dunling, the, the effect uh, of these entrants are on the current marketplace uh, and on entrepreneurs and investors, right? And, and what would you say to someone who's like, look, this is all really, really exciting, um, but is this the space for, um, you know, my, my, my parents or someone who maybe is uh, not necessarily a, a high-risk investor? Um, I feel like talking about the entrance of the major financial institution, we need to go back a little bit, going back to the third Harvey events of Bitcoin, which is last May, um, which a lot of believe started this current cycle of Bitcoin and crypto markets, right? And initially, I think the phase one is we heard that billionaire hedge fund managers like Stanley Drack Miller, Paul Taldo Jones says, oh, we put 1% uh, of assets into uh, Bitcoin. Then later in about last fall, we heard that major public companies like uh, MicroStrategy and Tesla, also major mutual fund um, pension um, uh, insurance companies like Mass Mutual, and they started to 
by uh, hundreds of billion dollars of Bitcoin or over billion dollar Bitcoin and put that as part of the reserve assets. And later on, then we heard about PayPal and Square. They start to offer the Bitcoin service to their app and the digital wallets. And so everybody can have easier access to Bitcoin, right? And that last phase, which is the, the spring, the last three months to five months, then we start to see major financial institutions like Fidelity, BlackRock, uh, Goldman and Morgan, uh, Morgan Stanley started to so, say, okay, we're gonna offer um, the exposure to our high net worth clients, right? And so this is still at the early stage of the mass adoption of this new market from Bitcoin to cryptos. And um, the effects of those entrants if you look at the market stats is first of all, of course, higher prices of Bitcoin and other major cryptocurrencies. Um, if you look at the price last fall, Bitcoin was about 10,000. Now it's 50,000, you know, four, five, four folds, five folds increase. And you also observe lower volatility actually in crypto market trading as, compa as compared to last cycle. Right. And then we also see the DeFi boom, which I believe is a product or one of the a side product or product of this um, major institutional adoption. Right. Moving forward, I think in the DeFi space, um, we expect to see maybe a wave of acquisition or partnership, which has happened between the in institution, financial institution of another in and the project teams of of the space, right? For ordinary um, investors from the traditional market, which is tend to be the perspective I, I take. And I think um, you have seen and you have heard that it is, Bitcoin is now become potential, a potential uh, new asset class for even from institutions to individuals to allocate part of their portfolio to, right? So why that's the case, right? And going back to the micro um, background or micro um, uh, backdrop is we have seen since the pandemic, right? Fed balance sheet increased from $4 trillion to nearly $8 trillion, right? Worldwide, the global debt to GDP ratio is over 300%. Right, and uh, people are concerned about debt monetization, concerned about inflation. So Bitcoin and other major cryptocurrencies becomes a potential uh, asset class to diversify that risk, to hedge against the bond position and to be part of the cash reserve that provides some yield. So moving forward, I think the trend is that more and more uh, institutions as well as individuals who will begin to adopt Bitcoin and cryptocurrency as part of the portfolio allocate a small percentage to this asset to hedge their existing position, especially the 60-40 traditional stock and bond portfolio. I think Thanks. also interestingly is that we'll probably see a lot of stablecoin uh, uh, allocations as well. So, so currently, like especially like when we are in low interest rate like economy at the moment, and and the current interest rates, for example, in decentralized finance, are substantially higher. There's a big arbitrage opportunity between traditional finance and, and decentralized finance. And I think kind of like uh, I would say even uh, that maybe having let's say Bitcoin, Ethereum currencies that are uh, to some extent have more market exposure uh, and and volatility. Uh, might not be feasible to, to, let's say, many treasuries, but for example, stable coins could become one of the alternatives to, to, to the actually current dollar yields uh, in, in treasuries and savings accounts. And we might see more adoption in, in actually uh, stable coins in balance sheets. And maybe even I could argue that uh, as we move forward, that this happens in actually non like so custodian directly with, with decentralized finance, but through, for example, service providers uh, such as uh, custodians that are integrating DeFi and providing this as a service or, or the, the coin basis of the uh, world. Hey, hey, Stani, for those who may not be as familiar with stable coins, can you just briefly say why do you think you see more um, kind of allocation in the stable coin space? Yeah, so, so practically what, what is a stable coin is stable coin is actually a, a cryptographic assets that is tracking the price of dollar and the, the mechanisms behind why it's tracking the, the, the US dollar depends on 
kind of like a what system they're using. For example, there might be equal amount of one on one backing uh, actual dollars in a bank account, which which is the case of the USDC. Might be some sort of other kind of like an algorithmic way of of, of uh, having more collateralization uh, in smart contract than the actual issuance of a stable coin. And the the reason that actually stable coins are yielding quite high at the moment in in let's say decentralized finance and and also centralized finance is is because there is so much demand, especially in decentralized finance. Uh, there is so much uh, innovation going on, and there is new and new protocols coming in, and that ties up the the the, the availability of stable coins and increases the yields. Currently, uh, if you look at the the Aave protocol, uh, there is roughly uh, two billion worth of uh, stable coins uh, in, in overall across across all the markets, and and I would say that uh, in in the current state, even uh, because the interest are paid in 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 stable coins itself, it means that those stable coins has to grow by the fact ten uh, percent annually, which means that that's the kind of like a, a growth rate. Be, be, Without actually calculating in the the innovation, and and because there's so much um, uh, efficiency and how liquidity moves uh, in 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 decentralized finance, it actually brings a lot of opportunities for treasuries to actually think how where they want to actually get that stablecoin yield. Do they want to get it from Aave, from some other lending protocol, or some some other instrument uh, in in the future, depending on the risk and so forth. But it's a long process still. I think it takes. Um, year or two to actually get some adoption here. So let me let me take a step back. And there are a, a lot of people who uh, uh, are watching this today, and they're maybe budding like innovators and entrepreneurs, right? And and they want to know what are some of the issues they should be thinking about, right? If they want to kind of enter this space in 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 uh, you know as uh, as an entrepreneur, as a, as some new innovator, as an investor. And, and I wanted to kind of turn it over to all of you. Aaron, I'll start with you. Um, what do you think are some of the issues that um, you know, investors are really looking for in assessing a DeFi uh, idea, right? Is there sort of an approach here? Do you have to be a technologist to be in the space? You know, is the market saturated? I sort of want to briefly touch on you and just have everyone else. Uh, I want to sort of follow up with, with uh, um, uh, uh, Stani and then Donling on that. Yeah, it's a great question. And I'm sure Stani and Darling can also address it. I know Stani makes <laughs> a number of investments into projects. I'd say that there's a lot of interest in blockchain technology and particularly in DeFi. Um, and if you are a strong team and are solving a real problem and do have a particularly strong technical bent, um, it's not uh, impossible to raise capital. Um, I think um, a number of projects are emerging uh, they're kind of continuing to think about uh, different, uh, more non-custodial uh, protocols that could solve other you know, financial problems or other things kind of adjacent to DeFi. Uh, and if the product is well thought out, if it's uh, actually built or on its way to be built um, and it solves a, a real uh, problem, I imagine that capital in some sort would be able to be provided. Um, the nice thing about uh, the Ethereum ecosystem and, and the blockchain ecosystem off the bat, uh, it's the bleeding edge of, of all technology. So most of the teams are remote, they're scattered across the globe, uh, they're deeply enmeshed in open source technology. Um, so the form of your business can be a bit more flexible than it, than it may need to be if you're talking to a traditional uh, venture capitalist. Um, and at the same time, there's different demands, like most of the successful projects really do try to build really broad and wide communities, folks that want to support the project, that want to rally behind it, and ultimately may have a hand in governing the protocol. Uh, so I think that that's another differentiating factor. And then last, with the normal caveats which are to be expected from a law professor, there are lots of legal issues here. Uh, <laughs> and these are the types of uh, things that you may want to put some thought into off the bat. Um, you know, you may not be able to avoid all, all these questions and there's lots of gray areas, but you should at least know what you're walking yourself into uh, and really try to think that all through uh, before you go too far down the, the path. Uh, so, so maybe that's a bit of an, an overview. I don't know if, uh, if Stani or uh, Darling, uh, you have uh, yeah, other thoughts? Yes, Stani, we'd love to hear, obviously, you know, you, you're, you're, you've done this, you're doing this. Um, how difficult was it for you? What would you say? How would you advise someone who kind of want to follow 
uh, in, in your footsteps in terms of what are some of the issues out there, how difficult it was to be able to kind of attract investment, and then just what's the approach, right? Just from a scalability, do you start small? Do you, do you start large to create value? Do you offer all sorts of products and services? Uh, it'd be interesting to, to hear your experience. Yeah, definitely. So, so, so building decentralized finance is, is, is in, in terms of like financial product is one of the most difficult thing to do. So you're practically building something that, you know, traditional finance has like banking services and, and in terms of like security, all the contracts, smart contracts, everything are public it means that you have to put a lot of effort and resources to design systems that uh, should not have any malfunction economically. So the economical formulas has to be uh, very well designed and the technical implementations as well. And also typically when you build decentralized um, financial protocols, um, it's very important to actually audit those protocols. Um, and audit pretty much means that there are technical teams, uh, third parties that are actually looking at the code and, and, and reviewing before it goes into a live production mm -hmm. uh, network that there isn't any kind of vulnerabilities there and it's typical that you have one or two audits. Uh, the Aave version two protocol had uh, five different independent audits and also formal verification where you mathematically try to uh, prove that the technical implementation is correct. So it's a lot of tech heavy uh, process to build these protocols and, and economic kind of like a, the economics design here. Uh, and I would say that uh, how you approach this kind of like a, uh, this kind of protocols is that you have to have enough resources and, and the, the, the talent to, to build this. And of course, like now the talent in the space is, is very scarce. Mm -hmm. I will say like extremely scarce, but the cool thing about decentralization and decentralized finance is that, you know, you, your talent is accessible. Uh, the talent pool is global. So anyone, any part of the world could actually build the next Aave and, and make it better what we actually created. And, and also the Aave team can look at what others are doing and, what has been built and improved from that. So there's this constant innovation uh, streamline. And I think there is actually no competitive modes in decentralized finance itself, because traditional, when you look at financial services, if you reach certain particular user base, let's say, or you get a some sort of a license, you kind of secure your position more because you have the end user um, uh, relationship there. But in decentralized finance, uh, there's actually you know, the, these protocols are completely public and open. Anyone can actually take your code, fork it, improve. Uh, but beyond that, if the, there is issues in the governance, for example, that the mi mi minority isn't respected, the minority can always fork the, the protocol as well and, and, and actually uh, reward the early adopters. In that way, you actually have to have very fair consensus across the, 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 the community and the, the, the protocol itself, because there is no absolute remotes uh, in, in these terms as finance, which makes the uh, whole space very transparent, very fair and, and better finance. But definitely I would recommend to, to start by just reading and researching and looking at how the existing protocols are built, how they work and, and what's the, 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 the bigger picture here of actually uh, taking finance and, and, and giving the ownership of finance to, 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 to people and who actually use, use these protocols. That's the kind of like a thesis we're building things. Hey, Donling, so do you do you think you have to be a technologist to be in the space? I mean, I think obviously it's it's you know based on the discussions we're having here, you have to have a or at least have a team right uh, put together that really has kind of a, a, a deep understanding of all of the different things that we've talked about, right? The, the protocols, the app, the the the, the governance. Um, and, and, and clearly uh, a deep understanding of, of finance. But if you were, uh, you know, advising someone in one of your classes or someone who sort of a, a approached you and they were sort of really interested in entering the space, uh, what would you say are some of the issues at least they should be thinking about? Right, I, I feel like uh, currently we are still building layer one of DeFi, which is belongs to our uh, computer scientist. But once the market grows, it grows from $1 billion to $60 billion just by the value locked in the protocols in the past 15 months. That's 30% of the growth rate per month, right? But moving to this stage, I feel like we need to build layer two, um, which is the supporting services or supporting um, uh, uh, new businesses to help people to understand 
and to use those uh, defined services, right? And so I would tell my student, because my students are business students, I would tell them, you still have a space in, in this new area, right? And because DeFi puts a lot of responsibility on users, and most of our users, typical users, are not tech savvy. So we do need a lot of support here to help them to reach to the, to the mass for mass adoption. Uh, I feel like people can think about, for instance, education, right? Not formal, but also informal. If you look at YouTube channels, how many of them have grown because of they talk about DeFi and talk about crypto last year. And also communication. Our teams, like Stanley's team, and they are doing great like product, but we need people talk to us every week and tell us, you guys are still doing the business? Oh, our money is safe, right? <laughs> and that's very important. We also need auditing teams who can give us the, who has the reputation to stamp on the project, telling non-tech savvy people, this is safe to invest, right? We also need a lot of independent research and risk risk uh, assessment uh, uh, analysis, right? And crypto analysts, which I call, to provide independent research, tell us what's the risk and return trade-off of each protocol. And finally, we need crypto managers, right? And this goes back to traditional finance. We need managers to help us to make those decisions as opposed to every individual go there to read the code. Donling, I, I, I think that's, that's you know, really um, uh, uh, spot on. Uh, I, I think we've heard uh, the importance of the kind of technical aspect, of, uh, but you're right. There's room here as it's growing for, for you know, the risk management, risk management, you know, auditors, uh, crypto managers, as as you called it, those in the insurance space to kind of sort of grow as this grows to, particularly as you kind of said, it's kind of on on level one. Um, we've got a question out there um, as to, and I sort of want to quickly touch on this um, as to how this, how you know. Um, we're going to be very integrated into an AI world and how will sort of crypto benefit from this. So I don't know if any one of you all want to take that question. So it's the sort of relationship between um, crypto and decentralized finance and artificial intelligence. Yeah, I can take that. I wrote a little bit about this in, in my book. It's not, it's not here yet, right? Blockchains that you can view as very, very, very slow computing systems, uh, you know, not computers we have today, more like the computing power that we had, you know, 10, 20 years ago, uh, probably more like 20 years ago in the 90s. Um, so there's a lot that needs to be done in order to kind of merge the world of artificial intelligence uh, and running some of those more advanced al algorithms on a blockchain itself. So that being said, uh, I think the output from AI uh, probably will have a tremendous uh, impact on how DeFi and crypto markets operate. Just looking at what Stani and others talked uh, about before, arbitrage opportunities, um, et cetera, uh, you can imagine AI-based systems becoming more and more efficient and starting to play those roles. And you don't actually need a human or you just need a smaller group of humans that are, that are able to do that. Uh, so I think eventually those two worlds will emerge. When that happens, I think you'll start to see these new emergent organizations called DAOs, increasingly run by artificial intelligent agents. And you may actually see NFTs that are powered by AI. We're starting to see that already. Uh, so the internet is an odd place. It's a bit weird. And I think, uh, I think once we layer on GPT-3 and more advanced forms of AI, it's just gonna get a bit odder. I, I am looking forward to that. That may be terrifying for some, but I think a weird internet is a good, a good internet. Oh, we're, we're gonna bring it down now to, to the, the layer that we're at. And, and, and you had sort of mentioned in some, in some prior remarks that uh, you know, as, a, as a, um, a, a law school professor, right, that you should be sort of mindful of some of the sort of legal issues that are raised. And, and kind of thinking about what we just sort of talked about um, as an ex-regulator myself, right? If you're just about to enter the space uh, and you're trying to navigate the regula regulatory space, um, what do you believe are some of the basic controls or areas of focus for, for regulators? Yeah, for regulators and you know for entrepreneurs, because I think right. they're two sides of the same the same coin. There's just a as every anybody that is a financial regulator or any lawyer that deals in financial services related. Uh, legal matters. There's just a whole host of guardrails and, and laws that we put in place to protect consumers, 
to stamp out uh, fraud or tax evasion or worse, things like terrorist financing. Um, and those laws all still exist, right? Just because it's a new technology, just because we have new tools, doesn't mean that these existing legal regimes uh, you know, fade away completely. So concerns related to uh, anti-money uh, anti laundering, know your customer uh, mm -hmm. related matters seem to be top of mind for most regulators. And those mm -hmm. laws you know, are well-intentioned. They're trying to stamp out fraud. They're trying to limit the use of uh, assets for illicit activity that could, that could create some sort of uh, more severe or uh, more um, concerning uh, social activity. Uh, if you have a protocol or system that's generating a token, there's looming questions about what the heck is that token? Is it a commodity? Is it, it, is, is it a security? Mm -hmm. uh, those are questions that we've dealt with in the blockchain ecosystem for a number of years now, starting with the token boom in 2016 to 18. Still some open questions there, although hopefully I think we're getting closer to some clarity. Uh, once you know, if you have a token, what the heck it is, there's also tax considerations, which are the most boring, but oftentimes the most important. Yeah. Uh, and there's still lots of questions related to that. Uh, and then depending on, you know, what you're trying to do, uh, a whole host of other laws can come into effect, right? If you're trying to build something that feels a little bit more like a, uh, like a commodity or is involving a commodity and is involving the exchanging of commodities, then there's a whole host of commodities laws uh, which come into play. Uh, as well. Um, so those are just, you know, a taste. There's there's a ho whole host more. And, you know, the closer you get to touching consumers, obviously, the, the more concerning about it. I think in terms of guardrails, what folks are trying to understand is, you know, maybe the laws are not perfect now. Uh, I think most level-headed lawyers and regulators know that's not the case, but what should they look like in the future? Um, and in many ways, I feel like the where the value is accruing, who's generating a profit or making a killing will probably uh, shape uh, where policy goes over the next, you know, five to 10 years, along with decisions of courts and other matters uh, and other folks as well. Yeah, and this is sort of continuously evolving, obviously, in, in some ways, uh, you know, slowly in other ways, uh, not, not so much. Um, so being mindful of time, uh, there's just one final question that I'm going to uh, uh, ask all the panelists and then see if we have time for um, some additional questions. Um, uh, from uh, from uh, uh, the, that we're getting via the chats, because um, I think really any one of these topics, to be frank, could be its own uh, its own sort of separate session. Um, so I think really the, the point of today was trying to touch upon as many as as we can, just to kind of highlight some of the issues out there um, when we're talking about entrepreneurship in crypto and in DeFi. So. Um, you know, the question uh, that I get a lot, and I'm sure you all get is, has there been like this breakthrough moment for DeFi, right? We've all just seen the kind of Coinbase um, IPO and, and, you know, often people are like, okay, so is this it? Is that the breakthrough moment? And how will the IPO affect the ecosystem? We'd love to get your sort of final remarks on, on that point. And I'll start off with uh, Domine. Um. So Coinbase IPO, Coinbase is the largest crypto exchange in the United sure. States. Yep. It's the first debut of the uh, major player from the crypto space to the mainstream market, which is stock market. So it's 5% population now to 55% population who holds stocks directly. So I think that's a milestone event for the crypto space as well as for DeFi. And also uh, uh, Coinbase is actually one of the very few unicorns that went public since 2020 that's profitable. Right. So that's amazing, right? So they enhanced their revenue by three folds in one year, like just amazing. So this tells you how quickly the space is growing. It can increase greatly the awareness of the public on the crypto space and also facilitate adoption of cryptos as well as DeFi. And but if you ask me what will be the breakthrough, I think it's a milestone case. My breakthrough uh, event in my brain is going to be the ETF, Bitcoin ETF and crypto uh, index ETF. I think that will be a, my uh, breakthrough <laughs> for the entire space. Thank you, Domain. Uh, Aaron? Yeah, I, I don't think we've seen a breakthrough for DeFi yet. I mean, there's a number of really, really powerful projects um, that I think will increasingly become important, but I don't think it's broken yet through to consumers in the same way that I think N NFTs are starting to kind of have a bit of their moment in the sun. Um, so I think that there's a really long road ahead 
in terms of maturation of both the protocols, the governance related to the protocols and the user experience that we have to go into. I completely agreed uh, with what Darling just mentioned. I do think Coinbase going public was a big deal. Uh, you know, basically, you know, Wall Street can't avoid crypto now, right? They have to cover it. They have to uh, understand what's going on there because one of the largest publicly traded companies in the United States, uh, you know, at its core is a crypto company. Uh, that being said, I wouldn't be surprised if in five years Coinbase looks like Yahoo and we've seen, you know, some uh, emergent uh, product or service that's built or relying on DeFi that really is the Google of this era. Uh, so I just don't, I don't know if we're there yet, uh, but it's super exciting. There is tremendous opportunity here. If you are a student or somebody uh, that is trying to break into the ecosystem, it's very early. It's like, uh, you know, if you wanted to work in this space in the over the internet in the 1990s uh, and decided not to because you thought it was too late, in hindsight, that would seem kind of comical. I think it's it's similar here. So lots of exciting things, and I, I don't think we're at the breakthrough moment yet. Stani, you've got the final word. <laughs> Yeah, I think definitely like adoption will, will take time and, and, you know, the space is still very early. I mean, decentralized finance itself, uh, uh, the whole market kind of like a size, if you look at the value locked in the protocols and smart contracts is, is from 60 to 80 um, billion uh, US dollar worth. So it's, it's relatively small market yet. So most of the things are now focused on the actual innovation and, and just uh, creating this new financial primitives and, and, and new products and services. I think over time, we will see uh, more prog progression, especially from traditional financial perspective. I believe that in the future, we'll see kind of like a realm uh, such as similar as we had in Linux, which is practically open source community by itself, where, uh, but the product, of course, is oper oper operating system. And today, for example, each uh, Linux release has over two and a half thousand contributors across, across the globe. And most of the com contributors aren't actually volunteers, but they are... Um, uh, engineers working in uh, big tech and, and different tech companies just to contribute into this mission critical software. And I believe the same will happen kind of in this into finance that the um, centralized financial service providers will actually use these protocols as a, as a tech stack and they contributed, contribute to build them further. But I, I'm very uh, hopeful and I, I think there's uh, this interest finance uh, makes finance itself very efficient. And I think there's a uh, a lot of potential here. Well, listen, I don't think that uh, I have any more key takeaways. It's it's pretty obvious uh, how a sort of exceptional and uh, informative you've all been. I wanna thank you all for uh, taking the time and being on the panel today. And I wanna thank the DFS and the team at SUNY for uh, setting all of this up today. And for all of you for sending your questions in, we try to get as many as possible. Um, thank you. And just one final note, the final session of the FinTech Innovation Webinar Series, Part 3, Risks in Crypto Innovation, will be held on Monday, May 24th at 12 p.m. Eastern. And I think you've got a, a screen up right now uh, about the series. You can get more information at rfssuny.org uh, backslash FinTech. So thank you so much and uh, have a great day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much, Maria. Nice being on the panel. Thank you.